Nice, slowly trickling in. We'll see if the first question that you'll answer is what is factor H? <laughs> Hopefully I'll cover that in the first slide, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, while we wait, it's the most awesome project is what someone already said. Mm, that's nice. So there you go. I don't, you don't even have to explain it now. People who know me already, so. <laughs> My siblings might be dialing in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you and you are um, the president and founder. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is this is not my real job. You know that, right? Yes, I know that. Yeah. I've I have similar. You know, I'm in a similar boat where I run as a full time volunteer a nonprofit. Yeah. So I. I totally can relate. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as people trickle in, I uh, just wanted to say thank you everyone for joining us for this session where we'll hear from Nacho about Factor H, what it is, who he is, and what the organization is doing to help bring change in the HD community, specifically in South America. Um, so, with that being said, we're almost done with day one, which is crazy. It went by fast, at least it did for me. But, um, you know, we're going to kind of just kind of get it, get into it. So Nacho is the president and founder of, of Factor H. And he also, from what I just learned, has lived all over. I think not just all over the country, but all over somewhat the world too. Um, and as mentioned to me, as you get older, you tend to have cool new experiences, including, which is a place I'm jealous of, is prior to COVID, you know, one of his favorite spots was, was Bali and Indonesia. So hopefully one day you can get back there, um, you know, when, when things get a little bit better in, in today's world. But without further ado, Nacho, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here today, and just to give everyone a quick uh, update on how it will work, Nacho will um, present for about 20 minutes, um, uh, followed by a Q&A at the last 10, but if you have questions, feel free to put it in the chat or put it in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer all the questions. So without further ado, Nacho, the uh, screen, I guess, is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm sorry that I can see people's faces. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Thank you, Seth, and thank you, Matt, and thank you, HDYO, for inviting me to speak about Factor H. Um, I am a neuroscientist working to find treatments for Huntington's disease. And Factor H is a nonprofit organization that started as a, as a project um on my own that uh, has grown now um to be able to work together for the uh, betterment of the quality of life of hd families in latin america um i wanted to start by by saying the reason why we're called factor age and again i um uh, there are three aspects to the age hope humanity and huntington's and all of them are factors in, in, in the life of families uh, with Huntington's disease. And I often found that the most dominant factor was that of the disease. And what we want to, to work towards is to bring the other factors together to have a, a more profound impact on the quality of life and the trajectory of new um, generations um, that are um, affected by Huntington's disease. The human factor is what brings us together to, to hopefully instill a sense of hope and to change the reality of the lives of the people that we serve. And um, those are gonna be the dominant themes through the presentation today. The presentation is dedicated to um, all of the families and all of the many friends that I've met throughout these years in South America. 
Uh, some of them are listening to me today. So thank you for, for being there and for working with us. We're here to serve them. And I think it's very important, especially in um, today's environment, to, to, to start this talk by um, um, stating that we're working together to change the future of families affected with Huntington's disease, whether it's through scientific or humanitarian means. But that has to come um, in the context of acknowledging the past. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of the populations in Venezuela and why they have been a, an instrumental force behind scientific advancement, but also behind my own motivation to start Factor H. And I don't think we can change the future without acknowledging our common history, history scientifically and history in terms of suffering and in terms of a, a shared experience with this disease, whether as scientists, relatives, or people who have inherited the mutation. So let me start by, by making sure that especially young generations, like many people who are listening to me today, understand the importance of the discovery of the mutation that causes Huntington's disease, and the fact that that was largely made possible by the incredible contribution of families affected by Huntington's disease in Venezuela on the shores of Lake Maracaibo. This is a photograph from Nancy Weichler and, a, and um, a paragraph from one of her articles. And I just wanted to just um, make you reflect a little bit on this sentence. More than 10 generations of families affected with Huntington's disease over a period of almost 20 years, um, more than 18,000 individuals contributed samples and participated in studies so that we could understand the disease much better and we could eventually identify the cause of the disease. These numbers are very impressive and they're not to be forgotten. I think it's very important for every young person who comes from an HD family to acknowledge that aspect of the history of the evolution of the disease. The contributions to science were manifold. First one, they allowed the mapping of the gene in 1983. They allowed the discovery of the mutation in 1993. Thanks to the participation of people from Venezuela, we understood the mode of potentially the mode of action of the mutation by studying very rare individuals that have two copies of the, of the mutation. We understood the symptom progression in domains other than motor, including cognitive and psychiatric, and how they were highly variable depending on individuals and within families. We also got evidence through their contributions of the fact that the disease could be modified by ways other than the expansion in the CAG repeat. And finally, they contributed thousands of research samples. And that is um, a contribution that really enabled the maturity of the field as we know it today. You, you will all have heard by the end of tomorrow the incredible progress that we have made in the context of finding therapeutics for Huntington's disease, and particularly by targeting directly the cause. And that cause, these drug development campaigns, is a direct consequence of the fact that we were able to identify the mutation in the gene that causes Huntington's disease. It is also important to understand that we as a community of clinicians and scientists have also a sense of responsibility to give back to the individuals that contributed to our understanding of the disease and provided samples. And that can be taken the shape of enabling genetic, um, um, genetic diagnosis, making the tests available in those countries, as well as potentially um, facilitated access to drugs that are developed as a consequence of the research that they participated in. So what is the situation for the families in Venezuela today? And this is, uh, I'm gonna show us a set of pictures and a video that hopefully you can hear that will frame the context through which Factor H was created. One of the main towns in Maracaibo where these families uh, were studied is the town of Barranquitas in Venezuela. It's the largest cluster of Huntington's patients in the world. Something about 10 to 30% of every 
a person in this town of about seven to 10,000 people is at risk or carries the mutation for Huntington's disease. The prevalence is the highest in the world. And it is a city, a town that lives in extreme poverty. There, there is almost no medical and social assistance. Many, in many cases, patients live in extremely vulnerable conditions and the kids, young people, as young as this girl, in this case, she was six at the time, have to take care of their parents and therefore they can't go to school or they can't work. The conditions are dire in these communities. As you can imagine, the most terrible feeling is the feeling of a lost hope. And I just wanted to start with a video again that will capture what we're trying to do about regaining the sense of hope. Meet Brian, a 13-year-old boy I met when visiting the town of Barranquitas in Venezuela. This town is a forsaken village where in every corner one finds another person afflicted with Huntington's disease wandering the streets. A town where the stories repeat themselves generation after generation. Another human being afflicted with Huntington's and dying in obscurity. The Lake Maracaibo, flanking the right side of the town, glows in the unrelenting sun, dark and bright at once. The only school in the town lays dormant, all furniture stolen, the voices of the children long gone with hot wind coming from the lake. From the corner of my eyes, I saw a little kid following us. He stayed at a safe distance. He looked at us wondering why we were there. I called him over, but he hesitated. Even though he was only 11 years old at the time, he had lost his mother to Huntington's a few years back. His father, I asked. He said he was shot and killed two years ago. We asked where he lived. He didn't want to say. We insisted. We said we wanted to help. He lived alone. Alone at 11. A decaying filthy mattress lay on the floor of a tin hut. Inside, there was no furniture, no bathroom, no kitchen, no clothes, no books, no pictures, nothing. It is as if his very existence didn't matter. It didn't exist to the world. How many other kids like Brian are there in this town? In a scientific world where we want to measure and quantify everything, how do we measure the impact that hope has in a child or in a community? I wonder, is changing the sense of hope for one single child enough? So I said to our colleagues, Treat them like they're my kids. Give them a bed, clothes, shoes, find them a teacher, find them a home, give them hope. They are important, not forgotten, not lost. Okay. So our vision, our vision is a world in which families and communities affected by Huntington's disease live in dignity, equality, and prosperity and they're able to exercise their basic and fundamental rights, which include the right to health and the right to education. This is what drives us, is the intersection between extreme vulnerability and the disease. We've set up a structure by which we try to tackle all aspects that affect the lives of people with Huntington's disease in these communities. The first one is health and disease management, youth, which is the subject of today, community development, because you can't deal with the impact of Huntington's disease without dealing with the social connections that are necessary to maintain an adequate quality of life for families affected with HD. And finally, data collection and advocacy in order to um, bring, bring to, the, to the front the situation of these families and hopefully engage local authorities in terms of providing better care for those communities. One thing I wanted to say is that Factor H does not engage in scientific or medical research. We will not be asking people to donate samples or participate in a clinical study. Where do we currently work? Besides Venezuela, we also work in Colombia, particularly on the Caribbean coast and in Peru in the province of Cañete. 
those are the three clusters for Huntington's disease with the highest prevalence in the world. They're all located here in South America. And therefore they become the areas where we concentrate most of our work. I wanna tell you a little bit about one of the projects that really impacted my life in the most positive of ways. And it started by visiting and getting to know the situation of some of these kids, many of whom have been abandoned by their parents, were all at risk for Huntington's disease, and in many cases were taking care of an affected father or mother. Let me read this poem. My fate is not sealed. I too, when a canvas to paint, help me draw my future. Give me the paints, the canvas, and the colors. The rest I will create. The goal, the goal for us is to bring hope and to give these children the tools to grow up healthy, empowered, and with more opportunities to lead productive lives. And to also not hide behind the shame and the stigma associated with Huntington's disease. So we started a program initially focused on young kids between the ages of five and 18 um, to try to create a community of young people who will be organized, who will face the reality of their lives together, and uh, for us to be able to channel financial effort and uh, the collaboration of many groups, including universities, volunteers, and international organizations to give them the right to education and the right to health, and also the right to grow up with more opportunities. Program Abrazos completed its fifth year in Colombia um, last year, we're on our, our sixth year, and the program has now 37 children in Colombia, 120 children in Venezuela. And more recently, we began to focus a lot more on education and we're starting small schools to take care of most of those kids, like Brian, who part practically live on the street without parents in order for them to be able to get a proper education. So with your support and the support of many of our friends and colleagues, we've been able to expand the program, which we hope to do um, the same in, in the future. I just wanted to show you a couple of, couple of pictures. This is me with this girl called Jos Bellis from El Difícil, Colombia, and some of the pictures throughout the five years, six years now that I've known her and I've seen her grow. And it is this personal interaction with kids at risk for Huntington's disease that has profoundly affected me at a very deep level. This is another example. The first time I went to Venezuela in San Luis, I ran into this kid on the street and I took a picture of him and his sister. It turns out a couple of years later that this kid will become part of our program and I've known him now for seven years. His name is William. So through the continuity of our work, we're not only giving these people opportunities uh, in life, we're also seeing them grow, which brings this project really home uh, to us. It's become a, a really emotional uh, aspect of our lives. Let me just show you one more video. Hola, queridos amigos. Mi nombre es Joandris Carolina Marín Oviedo. Tengo 12 años y vivo en el edificio en Magdalena. Hoy les vengo a hablar sobre una pregunta que nos hacemos todos en nuestro alrededor. Esa pregunta es esta. Cuando crezca quiero ser, yo les voy a hablar sobre mí. Yo cuando crezca quiero ser una gran científica. Bueno, quiero ser una científica para ayudar a mi familia con la enfermedad de Huntington, para encontrarle una cura en su enfermedad, eh, para ayudar a, otra, a otras personas con otras enfermedades. Ok, I hope you, you Henry has been with us for um, for, for six years as well. Let me just switch to the community. There's nothing that we can do to help improve the quality of life of people affected with Huntington's disease without a very strong community focus. The community is the one that's going to protect and enhance the quality of life of those individuals. And without getting those communities and families out of poverty, it's going to be very difficult to change the trajectory of the families afflicted by Huntington's disease in these areas. So we're, we're focusing on this aspect. Um, and I'm just gonna talk about a couple of examples of programs that we've started 
uh, to try to improve the, the, uh, the welfare of these communities. First one is we set up a basic assistance and, and COVID emergency programs in Colombia, Venezuela, and Peru. We've been assisting more than 450 families and over 3,000 indirect beneficiaries part of those families throughout 2020. We also started an advocacy campaign that involves art. So if you're a young person who is interested in art as a vehicle for social change, get in touch with us. One has been um, the street art program that we started in Colombia and we had to interrupt um, in Venezuela, but essentially in the towns where a lot of patients reside, street artists will come and do murals both of the caregivers, the kids at risk, and the patients. And we hope to expand this program as soon as we can travel again. Finally, we purchased a plot of land in Barranquitas. This is Google map of Barranquitas in, in, in the Lake Maracaibo. And here, a zoom in of a plot of land that we acquired a couple of years ago. And recently, with our collaborators, Habitat Luth and the architecture uh, school in Cal Poly Pomona here in Los Angeles, we have designed a, 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 the plans for a day center that we hope to build in order to increase the, our ability to have a physical presence and to take care of both the children and people affected with Huntington's disease. And we hope to start fundraising for building this very soon. I also wanted to say thank you again to HDYO. Here are all the kids from the program in Colombia uh, wearing the HDYO uh, t-shirt. And we both agree that we should be working very closely together to learn from the experiences of HDYO in other countries, to bring it to South America and to create a community that bridges together uh, regardless of the origin of, of these families into a common, a common purpose. We also organized a conference with, where Matt came and we brought together clinicians, scientists and youth. There is no reason why the scientists and the clinicians and social workers can come together. And it's very important for young children and for the uh, youth that came from seven countries in Latin America to our conference, not to get to know directly the people who are working very hard to find treatments for their disease. We celebrated Matt's 30th birthday. That was uh, three years ago. And I just wanted to end with a couple of more uh, pictures because I know my time is running out. As you know, we uh, were instrumental in the visit to the Vatican that happened in 2017, where we took two families from Colombia, Venezuela, and one family from Buenos Aires. I was the casting director, and I know these families uh, extremely well, and I'm still in touch with them. And I just wanted to show here, if you haven't seen the documentary, you should see it. It's called Dancing at the Vatican. And the picture here with the Pope hugging um, a young person named Anierbi, uh, from San Luis um, Maracaibo. And I just wanted to um, show one last video and Seth, give me three more minutes um, saying thank you. Okay, I'm going to pass this, but I think it's an important message to remember that um, we still have a lot of people we want to help. I just wanted to end here with a few still images. Please take a look. Okay, I just wanted to end by saying, what can you do if you're listening to this or if you happen to talk to other people associated with HDYO and you want to get involved or you want to know more? The first most important thing is remember history. We have a lot of things that we can give back to people in South America, particularly in Venezuela. And there are many, many, many families that need emotional support, they need connection, and they need to know that somebody cares. Um, if you're organizing an event, 
include Latin American colleagues. There's no reason to exclude them. And I know Matt wanted to have some of them come in person. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do it this year, but we can pull together resources to try to include them. Help us fundraise, pass the word out, or volunteer. All of those things are available to you. If you're interested in art, in science, get in touch. We'll be able to, to discuss what you can do. Finally, I wanted to thank all of our corporate sponsors without whom we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do. And finally, I just wanted to acknowledge the Factor H family, both the individuals here in the US, in Colombia and Venezuela that work for us, um, as well as all of the local associations, patient associations in Venezuela, in Colombia and in Peru, without whom we wouldn't be able to do any other work on the ground. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed it. Take care. Thank you, Nacho. Appreciate, uh, appreciate this. This was uh, very good. And a lot of people in the comments were just talking about how, how great the work you, you all are doing at uh, Factor H to help really make a difference in the community. And just saying it's, it's such an incredible project or just organization who is really, you know, taking the time to help out others. Um, one person even said, you know, it's, Sad to see how, the, how they live, not just with Huntington's disease and what it entails, but it's what you all are doing is a fantastic job. And just seeing the hope in their eyes is, I think, makes us hopeful too. Um, that being said, you know, one of the uh, questions we did receive was what's what, I mean, I know you kind of answered it, but like the best way to support and get involved with Factor H, um, you know, how can someone get involved is it going to the website is it emailing you yeah. it... you can go to the website you have my the info at factorh.org for general info it will go to bianca mora who's our executive director or you can email me directly and we have a lot of different projects um there may be a project that you're interested in particularly there may be ideas that you have um i think one of the things that is great about young people is that they're much more creative than us slightly older human beings so you know if you think that the mission of factor age is something that you resonate with there's a lot of things that we can do together and don't hesitate to get in touch okay thank you and, reg and regarding that i mean um does it matter where someone lives because i know a lot of your work is in you know uh south america so do does someone have to be living in south america or could someone like myself who's in the us help out of course of course i you know we're focusing in south america simply because these are the communities that really need help desperately and we're a very small organization as you know this is not my regular job a lot of other people are volunteers and we live all over we live in europe in south america in in north america and the more people that know about this problem the more people that want to help the more we'll be able to grow i am convinced that there are towns like this in other countries, probably in Africa, in the Middle East, nobody knows anything about them. And what we're hoping is to, to, to build um, a strategy that can be applied irrespective of where people live um, uh, worldwide, where, where they're living at the intersection of poverty and, and Huntington's disease. So I think a lot of the work that we're trying to do, I hope in 10 years, we can be talking about how we're assisting people in other places, not just in these three communities. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. And I think that's, that's the important part, right. Is, is figure out more opportunities, um, in just, you know, other countries mm -hmm. and how, how do we support them? I think that's, that's very important. Um, I'm going to, if this is, if you're able to answer this quickly, cause I know we're running short on time. Uh, someone did ask, how do you navigate through the political problems or challenges that are happening in Venezuela to be able to help on site? Yeah, so the, the one thing that I didn't say at the beginning is that we work exclusively by supporting local nonprofits and associations. So they are the ones that do the work. We work together to define the objectives. We work together to fundraise, but they are the ones that know the local custom, the governments, and they are the ones that are critical in implementing the assistance. So the real heroes are all of the volunteers and all of the people that we work with in those countries. And our, our, our mission is really to ensure that local people help local families. We are just a conduit, a catalyst for that to happen. Okay. Awesome. 
Well, with that being said, Nacho, thank you again. Uh, This is great. Keep up the great work with Factor H. Um, And for everyone who is interested in getting involved, again, check them out on their website um, or reach out to Nacho himself. And, you know, we have, I believe, just one more session, but there is the having children options panel that is still going on in track one, if you want to join, if not, uh, track two is going to be happening right now um, where we're going to be talking about apathy and HD. So thank you again. And uh, hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.